by politicians. I want to live my life the way I want to live my life. I have a coin at home. I should have brought it. It's a 25 cent coin from the US. And it says right on their coin, live free or die. Right on their coin. Well, that's what I'm doing. You know, everybody in our society's got to pick on somebody. And, uh, but we've got broad shoulders, so pick away. And we're not going away. The Bandidos will be coast to coast, and that you can take to the bank. It's my country. I was fucking born here. My relatives died fighting for the freedom of this country. And I'll do what the fuck I want, you know? That's basically it. I really don't, I don't, I really don't give a shit. They can take their holier than thou attitude and keep it, you know? I'm a biker through and through. Been a biker my whole life. I can't see myself being any other way. So if you want to look for an expert, stop, because you found it, right? My definition of a biker is a guy who eats, breathes, loves, and dreams motorcycles. The average person that buys a bike, the average age is 43 and making over $60,000. But our, our customer base is, uh, I like to call it 8 to 80, wild, wicked, and crazy. When they say it's a family, it is a family. It's simple, good people. Party people, and I like to party, so <laughs> they're my type of people. If it is Roger, yeah, yeah, yeah. no knocking. And all the guys that passes here tonight, it's gotta show their dick. If I take my right, my mother shall send holy water on it. I'm telling you, uh, I can't. She's, she's really against it. She thinks I'm gone crazy. Yeah. Like, I bought my first ride at 47. I'm an old lady, I'll be 51. So uh, she thinks I'm going nuts. <laughs> but I like it. <laughs> I'm having fun. We, we got involved in motorcycles about uh, 12 years ago. Uh, we were at a course, and the guy uh, teaching the course asked us whether or not we wanted to be 80 and talk about what we didn't do or did we want to get out and have some, some real life. So we did, and I'd always wanted to ride a bike, and so I bought one. It never occurred to me to ride a motorcycle. Uh, certainly never occurred to me to ride one myself or to belong to a motorcycle club. Uh, we belong to a group called the Silverados, which uh, she and I actually founded a couple of three years ago. A definition of a Silverado is that somebody with silver in their hair, silver in their jeans, looking for the silver lining. Our motto is to uh, make a contribution and enjoy the ride. And it'll cost you a hundred bucks to be a Silverado and that money goes directly to the Young Street Mission. Uh, it's an incredible high when you go feed 150 kids that haven't eaten maybe that day. Uh, the kids on the street, it's an incredible high when you know that uh, the work you did uh, was the difference between a baby uh, getting the right medicines or not. What we've done is we've taken uh, riding motorcycles and uh, have given ourselves and uh, quite a few others something to do. I'm a waitress shooter girl. It's pretty good, it's lots of fun. Pretty much I get paid to have a good time. I work at uh, a nudie bar. <laughs> I like it, partying for a living. Oh, Caesars. Um, Scratch the well, we have quite a few bikers that come in. A lot of good friends of mine come there and, and party. All right, cheers. Here's to uh, being single, seeing double, and sleeping triple. Cheers. Bikers and strippers go hand in hand usually. We should have that. I drink our That's not why I ride a bike. It's got nothing to do with it. Oh, I've, I've got Harley shirts, I've got Harley boots, I've got a Harley watch, I've got Harley jewelry, I've got 
Yes, I've bought into the Harley world. I can't quite explain it myself. People who own a Harley take a lot of pride in their motorcycle. It's not just a motorcycle, it's a, it's a hobby. It's adding more chrome to it. It's making it louder. It's keeping it shiny, keeping it clean. You see somebody with a Harley, there's always a big wave on, on the roadway or highway, regardless of who you are. Um, it's not just riding from point A to point B. It's just getting on the motorcycle and just having that feeling of being, being free. Harley Davidson anymore seems to be as, as much of a lifestyle as it does anything else. I mean, it's uh, it's getting to act like a bad boy on the weekends, you know, and somebody you thought you might want to be, and it gets an escape from your day-to-day, -day, whatever you do for a living, be it a dentist or a factory worker or a doctor or a lawyer, whatever. You get to you do your thing all day long at work, and you get to come home, and if you have the time and the inclination, you can jump on your Harley, and all of a sudden you're out there on the road, you find yourself in a euphoric state of mind. You can be whoever you want to be for that instant moment or that instant hour or that instant three-hour ride. There's no wife, there's no kids, there's no boss, there's no buddy but you and your motorcycle. We also do our own thing in Grand Bend. It's like a two-day event of drag racing and live music at night on Saturday. That's been quite popular with our customers because they like to come and watch us go crazy on our Harleys. And, burn the track up and have some fun. You always get guys, whenever they're sitting down, you get two or three guys together. Ultimately, the talk comes to whose bike is faster. Oh, my bike's faster. Your bike's faster. It's a perfect venue for you to take your bike there. You pay your $35, you enter yourself in, and away you go. You start racing and proving to yourself and all your peers that, yeah, you do have the fastest bike, or no, maybe you might have thought you did, but maybe you don't, right? Yeah, but then she put out in the first date. <laughs> Marlon Brando, James Dean, and the Beatles all wrapped up in one. Then. <laughs> I think it all started for me, uh, not motorcycling, but Harleys, when I uh, went and saw the movie Easy Riders. So Harleys were just the cool bike. They were the only bike. The modern man has to repress his urges. You'll see people on the street or in cars or driving to work, they're talking to themselves. You'll see them in a rage screaming. They're having what I call a hissy fit, a sissy fit. You know, it's all, it's how they react to, to life now, and it's the way our society has gone. And uh, the Hells Angels and Harley Davidson have defined a certain type of manhood that uh, where you haven't bent down to those pressures. You can get into the, the Freudian uh, concept of why a man would want a Harley Davidson, you know extension, a penile extension, and that sort of thing. And, uh, and I suppose that's uh, a large part of it, if we we're going to be totally honest. Um, but the basic reason is just fun. Take Daddy's hand. Take Daddy's hand. When I was a kid, the sound of a pack of Harleys roaring up a street would make my hair stand on end. Um, it just, you know, it struck me as being a kind of a freedom thing, you know. You didn't care about what other people thought. You weren't out trying to impress the neighbors on your street. You weren't competing, trying to keep up appearances. It just seemed to you let it all hang out and do your own thing. Um, and that's kind of what, you know, attracted me to it. Nobody really cared where you came from or what you were all about. As long as you were a like-minded individual, you know, you were accepted. Yeah, you gotta let Daddy put One day, on. it was like my whole life crumbled. Yeah. You know, somebody in my life walked out on me. Uh, I lost my business. Like, all of these things that I thought were the, the Canadian dream kind of disappeared, you know what I mean? And there, it didn't seem like there was, you know, much sympathy. And, you know, the only people that were kind of there, <clears throat> other than my immediate family, were, you know, some of the club guys that I'd known for my whole life, you know? But I'll tell you one thing, um, I could count on my hand the number of people that still wanted to be my friend. We don't ask anybody to be an outlaw. 
And I'll see if uh, it's like spreading the word of uh, Jesus, you know? Like Jesus says, you don't have to go knock door to door. If people are with you and hang out with you and you're a godly person, they'll, they'll, and they like you because you're a godly person, well, they'll just follow in your footsteps, you know? And people come out and hang out with us and we go, we have, we probably have a, a couple more parties a, a year than just the regular Joe, and uh, but people come and they go to parties with us out of town or in town and uh, enjoy our company. And a lot of guys will go out and or a lot of guys will say, "Hey, uh, how do I become a member?" And it's like, "Well, you gotta go get a bike and come back and talk to me later." You know, I'm married. I've got a couple kids. Own my own business or a partnership with uh, another brother right. from the club right. and fix and repair and build custom motorcycles every day. Show uh, bull terrier dogs on, as a hobby with my wife and kids. And I would never do anything to put my family in jeopardy. Not only my immediate family like wife and kids, but my brothers and then friends after that. You know, I would never do anything to put, uh, excuse me, to put them in jeopardy. And, and like I said, I sat down with my wife before I became a member and uh, we talked about it. and. Uh, my wife's not a fool, and she no, understands, dinner. you know, and uh, there's, there is no problems. And there is no uh, initiation, like, we don't, uh, yeah, easy. we don't make you fuck no of... big fat broads or, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Days of the past, or, no, one I heard was, did you have to kill somebody? It's like, <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> There's a big difference between motorcycling and, and, and bikers. A motorcyclist is someone who enjoys the sport of motorcycling, and a biker is an asshole. The motorcyclist has always been the sport of the individualist. Motorcyclists, for the first 50 years, never rode in packs. motorcycle uh, operator for the OPP and have been uh, doing this type of patrol for 10 years. It's a Harley Davidson. The model in which I ride is a 2000. It uh, weighs 850 pounds, pretty heavy. They're a great bike. Uh, they have a low center of gravity and very forgiving. Uh, you just, there's one thing, you just can't forget who's the boss, and that bike is the boss. And uh, I respect that wholeheartedly. <laughs> you've got motorcyclists, and you've got outlaw bikers. In between, you've got the wannabes. The people who like to ride in packs, who are not outlaw bikers, be they the blue knights who are cops, be they your executives, or mom and pop who like to wear leather, the kind of people who go to Sturgis, where you've got half a million people who like to ride in packs, and very few of them would ever ride a motorcycle cross country on their own. A lot of people in Sturgis just called me Canada. They'd see my plate and say, hey, Canada, who are you riding with? And I'd be like, nobody. So people were praising me, calling me hard ass for riding that far. It was a happy moment riding into Sturgis all by myself. I made it. I work at Hydro-Quebec. My exact title is a commercial counselor. When uh, they're having problems with uh, dealing with uh, their stuff, I go there and solve their problem. And also, I end up downsizing. So I don't like talking about that because people hate me after that. Yeah, I got two daughters. One is it's going to be uh, 21, September 21st. And I got another daughter who's 17, who will be 18 in March. 
My oldest daughter hates Harleys. When I take off with it, she goes like that. She even hates the sound of it. And But my other daughter, she will ride the Harley one day. She loves it. They even call me La Madame now. <laughs> they don't even call me by my name. My very first ride on the Harley. Yeah. I do remember. It was uh, in 90... 97, there was a national art rally in saint Sauveur. I used to live there. So I saw this biker I found cute, and he needed a place to stay, and, and that became my boyfriend for three years. That's how I got uh, into uh, sitting on a Harley, and I got tired of sitting on the back after two years, because it's true, he had the sticker in the back, let those who ride the sign, and that used to piss me off. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm going to, nah, that's it. I got to write. I think that's one of the best things in my life that ever happened to me. Yeah, I used to play golf and do shit like that. I don't, I don't even want to see a golf, queue, a golf uh, club anymore. I, I, I think it's boring. <laughs> An awful lot of us have uh, uh, this desire to rebel against what we find is a confining life. You know, life is confining. We all work too much. Uh, we're all like tied into economy, whether we want to be or not. And so I, uh, these, the, these, you know, points, icons of rebellion uh, uh, have an allure for us, and we do reach out to them. How else does one explain, uh, and the, you know, the interest in gangster movies and the interest in the, uh, the outlaw generally in our society that appears in all kinds of different forms? I can't even remember how old I was, 19 or 20, I was in, uh, still in school. A friend of mine wanted to get me involved in motorcycling. I had no interest in it. So he plied me with a, with a lot of draft beer. The next thing I, I knew, I was in a, in a dealership buying a, a brand new Triumph. And then my friend taught me how to ride it. And I tried to keep the secret from my mom, but that was impossible, And because um, I knew she would disapprove. And um, so when my dad found out, that was the only, one and the only time I ever got kicked out of the house. And, uh, he says, you're going to be wearing one of those black leather jackets. So I went to the closet and pulled out his World War II bomber black leather jacket. That's different. That's different. <laughs> you know, the waves of bikerdom and bike clubs have always followed a major war. And the prominent people that joined the bike clubs or started bike clubs were disenchanted veterans coming back. And uh, they didn't have a whole lot of respect for society because they went off to fight the horrors of Nazism, and uh, they come back to be uh, disenfranchised. So, and the same thing uh, to a greater degree happened after the Vietnam War. You know, bikerdom has its own phoniness. You know, it doesn't matter where you go; there's phoniness. But, uh, but I found a, a basic honesty in bikerdom that uh, I found extremely refreshing, relative to what I had uh, experienced um, elsewhere. And so that drew me to, to the club and uh, became an avid member and was a Paradise Rider for, for 29 years, and at which point I, I joined the Hells Angels. So I used to sit up up at the clubhouse on a Friday night. There'd be like, you know, everybody would be out of their minds drinking and partying, and scantily clad young girls running around having a good time. The music would be loud. I'd be sitting in the corner reading James Joyce, and everybody would think I was a weirdo. Well, I try to go to a lot of the parties, regular parties, but like every weekend. I usually only go out every other, every third weekend. Cause, so I say, you know, I work a lot. I work all day, like 10 to 12 hours a day. And then to go out after that, it's like, well, I, I'm old. I need rest. <laughs> Bull Terriers. Terrorists. Yeah. They're Canadian <laughs> champions. Actually, they're both champions. Like Sam's class that. knew that I owned a bike shop and, <laughs> and rode a motorcycle, but they did not know I was a member of Outlaws motorcycle. One day I was heading out of town on my bike, and if I'm if I'm beating it anywhere, I always let my wife know so she doesn't worry, right? I'm gonna ride my bike out of town, so I figure I'll stop at the park and tell Sam I'm going out of town. So I'm riding there, and uh, she knows I'm coming because you can hear it in my oh yeah, and I'm thinking in my head, oh my god, please I, don't be coming. <laughs> and I pull up at this park, and I'm like, come here, come here, I need to talk to you. Well, all this class is waving at me because <laughs> Sam could hear me coming and says, oh, that's my husband. She's like, oh, no, that's my husband coming. <laughs> the class is like, it's okay, we'll wave at him. And Sam's like, oh, no, don't wave at him. Don't wave at him. <laughs> Please don't even look in but, that direction. <laughs> so I tell Sam I'm leaving. I've got to go away for a bit. 
I ran away while the music went back. And we're like, oh, Sam. We knew you had a life after yoga, but we didn't know it was this extreme. Holy God. It's all, just common all, interest, you know. It's like uh, your, your, your bowling league, you know. I mean, or golf. You know, you got four guys you play golf with all the time or whatever, you know, it's the same thing. It's, you know, we'll try this new putter out, it's graphite or whatever, you know, it's just, well, hey, look at this bike, well, look at this I got for mine, and, you know, it's it's just, it's just the bike, it's all about the bikes, you know. Yeah. And the parties, and, you know, like, uh, we go to parties, we have, we put on parties, and they're always good parties, you know, not just club members enjoy the parties, you know, like, Regular Joes off the street come to our parties and have a fucking great time, you know. And girls, women, they like bad boys. I'm not saying we're bad boys or nothing, but you know, they uh, they like that shit. A lot of people, and like we're in a property patch, it's this property up when we're out at parties. Everybody thinks that is like degrading or something. I would say it's not. People are going to come on to you. The guy's gonna come on, you think? It's better to forewarn him. Don't, <laughs> just don't do it. It's like, save yourself a big headache. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. You know, it's not the old days anymore, you know, like, I guess you could make a living selling drugs and robbing banks and shit, but, you know, everything's too high tech these days and that doesn't go on and, uh, you know, most of the guys in the club have jobs now. You know, you have to pay your way. You have to work to make your money. Uh, you know, we went, uh, I went 30 years not caring what people thought. And I still don't care what people think. But it's, um, I think it's time to say a few things. If we don't get up and stand up and, and talk to people and talk to the public about, you know, how this is ridiculous, you know, if the, then, you know, like you said, if you, if you have nothing to say, then, you know, you can, you can bury yourself sometimes with your silence. One percenter was actually coined by uh, a Southern Californian sheriff in the, in the late 50s or 60s who basically said that 99% uh, of motorcyclists are decent law-abiding people. The various clubs at the time were supposed to represent 1% of society or the 1% of motorcyclists who live outside of the law. But, you know, that's generally speaking, it's a load of bunk because it's more in spirit than anything else because, you know, a lot of members of all sorts of clubs work and pay taxes and don't get into any kind of trouble with the law other than maybe a speeding ticket or something like that. You have nothing to really worry about with a club scene or clubbers. I mean, they have their own lifestyle and their own thing. Either you're with it or you're not. They're not going to go out and intimidate John Q. Public into being one of them. That's not their style. They have their way of doing life, and if you want to be part of that lifestyle, go check it out. If you don't, they're not going to bother you. We don't need to fear biker wars and violence in Ontario like they do in Quebec. Even though we have Hells Angels, we have to remember that the guys who are Hells Angels in Ontario right now were Paradise Riders, Satan's Choice, Lobos, and Last Chance last year. These guys all know each other. They know that if they start violence, the cops will clamp down on them, especially in light of several pieces of legislation introduced in Parliament which give the cops sweeping powers to abuse rights. We're seeing an increase in extortion of bar owners, an uh, increase in assaults, uh, increase in intimidation. Uh, and this is all things that the public isn't uh, aware of. But certainly we see it almost on a daily basis now. In fact, these people aren't somebody to look up to. They're actually somebody that's involved in uh, corrupting the morals of society and really disrupting the community. One of the roles of moral panics and the demonization, the creation of folk devils in society is they allow the, uh, uh, the state and agents of the state to legitimize and justify what many of us would see as legislation uh, that really produces intrusions in our lives, that really does, in fact, uh, abrogate civil rights. There's no laws against wearing a patch, and yet we are treated as common criminals on the street by police officers. Yeah, there are members of every club who have criminal records and criminal pasts, but there are a great number of people in clubs that, that have no kind of pretensions of being a criminal. As I turned the corner, a Waterloo Regional SWAT team turned around, chased me, pulled me over. Gave me a ticket for handlebars. Oh, gear. 
You know, Waterloo <laughs> Regional, downtown Woodstock, you give me a ticket for handlebars. Because they happened to be in town on training uh, exercise or something. They saw him, so they ran him down and pulled him over and gave him a ticket. And then they had the nerve to show up in court. <laughs> they, actually gave, they actually gave back. <laughs> if, if you've never seen a full police roadblock with a, with a motorcycle club, it's a scary, scary thing because what are all these militaristic uh, um, SWAT teams and anti-terrorist squads? Uh, what, I mean, what are they doing on this country road? I have never seen uh, a serious charge being laid in a roadblock, and I've certainly been through hundreds of them. Um, that's not to say it hasn't happened, because you know, I'm not there the whole time. The roadblocks are, you know, a very valuable tool to outlaw motorcycle gang investigators. It, you know, uh, certainly there's parameters that have been set uh, with regards to what we can and what we cannot do with regards to roadblocks, and we fall uh, follow those parameters to the letter of the law. The importance, basically, is the intelligence that we're able to glean. Uh, it's the fact that it's one of the few times we can actually stop and talk uh, to the outlaw motorcycle gang members and establish a rapport. The cops spend most of their budget attending social events, watching the angels quaff their beer, taking notes on who's hanging out with who. And I call the Martha Stewart squad because all they're doing is documenting the social life of a biker. Unfortunately, I pay taxes for these people to sit on the side of the fucking road and watch me have a party. You know, that's my tax money going there. Because they want to see who comes. You know, well, listen, you weren't fucking invited anyway. I'll paint them all with the same brush. They're organized crime. They're criminals. They're involved in drug trafficking. They're involved in extortion. They're involved in anything that will make them money. They're involved in corrupting our society. If the motorcycle club members are the arch criminals that the police and authorities would like the public to believe, why are they issuing scratching, scratched helmet law, uh, helmet tickets and seizing helmets? Why aren't they investigating this ter these terrible crimes. As for, as for the clubs, I don't see what the big beef is with it. You know, like, the fucking cops hang around us enough to know what we do, you know? And if they, or they, they figure they know what we do, and they tell the media what we do, and if we do what they say we do, why are we here? Criminality is not the precursor to becoming a, a hell of an angel. I mean, I'm not a criminal, and it's uh, and never have been, and it's it never will be. But it's it's just a label that's been uh, laid on us, and that's not to say there aren't criminals within the hell's angels. I'm not uh, I'm not trying to sanitize or, or whitewash anything here. There's every type of person within the hell's angels. There's uh, building inspectors, store managers. There's, uh, one Hells Angel in Ontario designs, builds, and installs uh, climatic control wind tunnels for the major car manufacturers. Generalities are often difficult and misleading. However, certainly the main uh, source of income and revenue for outlaw motorcycle gangs is drug trafficking. And, you know, uh, statistics have proven. Uh, we looked at uh, outlaw motorcycle gang members, membership, uh, up until April 1st of this year. And we did a statistical analysis, and we found that 85% of the members of outlaw motorcycle gangs in Ontario have criminal records. Of those 85, 52% have convictions for drugs, weapons, and offenses of violence. The Outlaws Motorcycle Club has never, ever in Canada been found as organized crime. And, you know, like, we're not. You know, people think what they want to think. The police tell people 
what they want people to believe, and people are going to believe whatever, but we're not organized crime. Bikers, like any criminal, will make their money wherever they can get it. Gangs are made up of people with different kinds of talents, different interests, different connections. One guy may do his thing and never do commit a criminal act with anyone else in the organization. They don't know what he does. He doesn't want to know what they do. They get together for the social life, the parties and everything, the runs. But they know that this guy's a mover and shaker. He has connections. But by and large, most of these guys still know themselves by their nicknames. And so when the cops say, you know, they want an anti-gang law, which they finally got to bust the Hells Angels, it's not going to happen. The angels don't work like the mafia. There's no godfather who tells lieutenants to tell soldiers to do something. The truth of the matter is, is that there is no president of the Hells Angels. There is no head guy. And uh, again, this presents a huge problem for the police because who do you go after? Like if there's not, if their theories are correct, there must be the mythical head guy. Well, who is the head guy? It doesn't exist. The moment you become a Hells Angel, you're equal to everyone else. Uh, things are run on a democracy. One, one man, one vote, and that's how things are decided. Angels forever, forever study, uh, I'm not quite sure what the group is, but uh, there's been various uh, uh, brain trusts or educational types that have done studies, and you're looking at seven to ten billion dollars a year to organize crime in Canada. Guessing, trying to guess how much money the dopers make, how much money it would take to solve the problem, is a fool's game. If anyone when the cops say they think someone is involved in a multi-million dollar business, they don't know. Because if they knew this guy was making two million bucks, they would know exactly how he's doing it and they could bust him. Because they're lying. So if they're really serious about going after uh, clubs, take away the economy. Uh, we know that prohibition in the United States on alcohol in the 20s and 30s fueled gangsterism there. That led to the establishment of uh, organized crime groups. My suggestion is the way to deal with these systemic violence problems uh, associated with uh, drug prohibition is to stop the prohibition, to allow people the freedom of choice to engage in whatever kinds of uh, uh, substances they choose with the provisio that they act in a responsible manner. It's, it's like if they, if they legalized it, then tomorrow it would be what, five dollars a gram for coke instead of a hundred, you know what I mean? Well, if it's five bucks a gram, then all these people that are wired on it, hey, you know, they're not out robbing and stealing because it's only five bucks. They can go to town. I really don't care what they do with their lives. But well, alcohol is okay because the government can make money on it. They can charge taxes. They can control it. They can bottle it. They can sell it in their stores. So it's all right. Then they can charge you for when you fuck up on it, too. <laughs> take your license away. They can do all that. I mean, they make a fortune off alcohol. So alcohol will always be good. Uh, you legalize drugs, what are you going to legalize next? Uh, the fact that if drugs were legal, uh, you're just going to drive things underground. You're going to detract uh, the biker, you know, deter the bikers from being involved in drugs, perhaps. But they'll always be involved. They're always going to be there because there'll always be a market to make money that's outside the boundaries of the law. I think authorities need uh, a boogeyman, if you will, to stir up public furor, which stirs up the politicians, which frees the... the the purse strings at budget time so the police can, um, don't get me wrong, we need a, and want a good police force, but uh, it, it also becomes on the part of some officers, not all officers, to you know, build their own personal empires. Investigating an outlaw motorcycle gang is very labor intensive, and we can always use more people to, to do the job. Technology is also something that's become a significant tool in the fight against outlaw motorcycle gangs. 
So if I could have anything uh, right now, if I have my Christmas wish list, I'd be looking for uh, more human resources and, uh, and additional technology. They just want to keep perpetuating the same thing and get more money every year, and it's their job. It's how they make their living. They fearmonger the public for more money every year, and that's it. Otherwise, they'd all have to go get fucking jobs, wouldn't they? The ones that really stick out in my mind are the guys that are going through their second childhood, you know, and their their kids are growing up and they're looking there and whatever midlife crisis you might want to call it or whatever, and they decided, you know what, kids are all off out of the house now, married or going to school or doing whatever. I'm going to do something for myself, and they buy a bike the first time you see them. You know, they get their bike and a couple weeks later they got the chaps and they got the gloves, you know, and then six months later. You know, you see them walking in, they got the full bike regalia on, and they're cussing and swearing, and they're trying to be real macho and cool, but, like, they're still that CPA come Monday morning, they're back in their three-piece suit going to work, punching numbers, but they get that three days or two days or one day to be whoever they think they are. That's, I think that's the funniest transformation myself. Yeah, I'm bad. You're bad, I'm bad. You're bad, I know you're bad, but I'm bad and you are. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever your mother wouldn't let you do when you were a kid, that's what we do. You can't have a motorcycle. You can't belong to a motorcycle gang. You can't stay out at night. You can't do any of those things. You can't hang on the corner. Well, we can now, except the worst thing we do is we have seconds. That's probably the most risque thing we do is eat too much. Like I have a couple families where my mom and dad ride and all three kids ride, you know, and they all have bought their bikes here and all have them service here, and it's, uh, it's a good way to keep the family together. My daughter's name is Cherish. She's pretty neat. She aspires to be me. She's got all her leathers and stuff that match mine. And it's pretty cute. All right, biker chick. Just wait till I back out, and then we can get on. She's comfortable on the bike. She's a good rider. My son's name is Riley. He's shy. <laughs> Do you want me to help you? They're good kids. Just training the boy to ride the bike. He's a little shy about it. He's a little scared. Scared about being on the back of the bike. Nobody I grew up with really turned out like me. I don't have any girlfriends to ride with, but I ride with my mom, so that's cool. I've been around bikes all my life because my parents ride. My stepdad used to put me on the, on the gas tank, and he'd put a, a bungee around it for me to hang on to, and we'd go cruising around, so I guess he got me into it. So children and family structure are very much part of the Hells Angels lives. And I know that's not the stereotype, but that's simply the truth. Police departments go into the public school system to educate the children at a very young age about how evil the Hells Angels are. Um, our children are in those classrooms. Like, I just tell them, I want you to do better in life than anybody, okay? I want you to prove to them that our life may be a little different, but it's not any worse. The, the police in, may have good intentions, but I feel it's very misguided to, why you pick on a kid? You want to pick on somebody? Pick on me. I got big shoulders. But please don't pick on their children. I have been in uh, three motorcycle accidents, and one fairly serious where I was off work for quite some time. And I've got some pins and screws to, to prove it. <laughs> and after that spill, I just got right back on it. Taking it slow at first, because it is scary. And uh, when you get into an accident and you don't have a whole lot of protection around you, um, it's frightening. You just always got to be alert. You just never know what's going to happen and you just got to be ready to, to move uh, or to uh, conduct evasive actions if you have to. My mom loves it. She, <laughs> she loves the fact that I'm a police officer. She loves the fact that I'm a member of the Golden Helmet. She is so, so proud of me and carries all her pictures in her purse and tells all her friends. So proud mom she is. She may be worried, but never says anything. And I'm not good with names, so mind if I call you shithead. <laughs>
I like that one. I like my life. <laughs> what? It's called the apocalypse. That's, yeah, the name is right there. $43,000 invested in three years. Lots of money. But everything is so expensive. I mean, like my, uh, the, the foot pegs, the, the kickstand is uh, 350. These are 200. I mean, you know, 200 here, 300 there, and this and that, and it keeps adding up. And I didn't realize, but I always kept my bill, and one day I decided I'm going to start counting. Holy shit. prohibit people from having long hair, wearing patches, uh, uh, acting grubby, talking grubby, and driving motorcycles. The very idea is ridiculous. Motorcycling is about being an individual. And if, it, if you want to be like a Hells Angel like myself, then uh, you know that's great. And, uh, but if you just want to go down and ride your, uh, your BMW or, or whatever brand of motorcycle you happen to like, then, then that's cool too. You know, there's room for everybody in, in, uh, in the motorcycling world. I had houses all my life, and my needs are not the same anymore. If I have a roof and I got bread on the table, that's all I need now. I don't give a damn if the curtains are purple, the, the, the floor is yellow, and I got polka dot chair now. No, I don't know. I only live for my Harley now. It's really something. I'm gonna ride it until I can't anymore. When I'm too old, well then I'll make a three-wheeler with it and I keep on going. <laughs> I would say that most of all the motorcycle for us has become a bridge that's linked us to other people that we might not otherwise have met. Jane and I have done everything in terms of, we've owned a sailboat, we've, uh, we've skied a lot, we golf, we do all those things. I've never met nicer people than on a motorcycle. I would rather one of them watch my back than 20 police officers be standing there. I would, because I know that he's going to die for me. <laughs> Whereas the cops are just going to stand there and go, oh, did I miss it? No, sorry. I don't get how they want to make it illegal to be a biker. You know? There's cop bike clubs. Police have the thin blue wall, or the blue wall, and we have the red and gold wall. You know, we watch out for, you know, as they say, your brother may not always be right, but he is always your brother, and you back him up no matter what. You know, and this is one thing that uh, you know the cops would probably be disgusted if you ever even mentioned it to them. But they're really not that different. Police, f police forget that we empower them. We society ask them to serve and protect us. They think themselves above society and now with new legislation above and outside the law. The cops, through all their lobbying and lying and deceiving, have now become outlaws, and we're stuck in the middle. It's very easy for people to sit back in armchair quarterback. I can't tell you the number of Stanley Cups I've won. be quite candid the landscapes changing so fast unless you're on it day to day you're really not an expert people love to read uh, stuff in newspapers that's juicy gossip and that kind of stuff makes for great 
propaganda. The group of guys that got together and donated 50 grand to the Salvation Army, that gets a little two-line blurb in the back of Section 1. Some guy who's a clubber, you know, gets pulled over and harasses the cops, that'll get front page and they'll, you know, blow that all out of proportion. I mean, should take everything you hear and see with a grain of salt and somewhere between both stories, the real truth lies. Wow. <laughs> 